Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear QA number, I think we're 174. Yep, 174. I don't know why I just don't read that before I start this, this thing. I put it in the description and then I like act like I don't know after I just typed it in there about 10 minutes ago. Uh, but anyways, this is 174 episodes on YouTube of the live show. I think the podcast is at 200 and something. So this is the podcast live show. Uh, for those of you guys newcomers, it's pretty simple. If you're watching the rebroadcast of this, anything we talk about will be timestamped in the description down below. I take the time to put everything we talk about in a timestamp so you can go right to it. And uh, if you're currently live with me right now and you want to ask me a question or start a subject, you can start it with a question mark first lets me know you're talking to me and also you can stream this on spotify uh, uh was it spotify itunes um iHeartRadio, all the places where you get podcasts links in the description down below i'd like to point out something fun and exciting i think the podcast i think i've said this before has exceeded or surpassed the live show rebroadcast rebroadcasts uh which is pretty pretty crazy um so uh, and it exceeded a while ago, but I, I think I just mentioned it now. So a lot more of you are consuming it through a podcast as as a live show. So that means a lot of you. Uh, I think I want to tell the story. I don't know if I told you guys I had this weird experience and it was a while ago, but I was in the gro I think I told the story, but I was in the grocery store and I was talking to my wife and some woman went in a fender hat <laughs> was staring at me. Now, this is pre covid, so I didn't have a mask. We didn't have masks on. And um, she she goes are you are you the guy from know your gear and i said yeah and then i was thinking like oh the you know from the channel right i was like oh some person stopping me in the grocery store this is weird and then she's like ah that's what you look like she's like i thought you looked different she's like i listen to your show every week thanks and then she walked away and uh <laughs> i was like oh wow that was my first time being recognized by a, a voice uh over a face which is pr probably for the best <laughs> I have a face for podcast, as they would say. Uh, so today we have a lot of subjects to talk about. Uh, but one of the subjects we're going to start with was that I, I get emails all week. Every week I get emails. And sometimes you start noticing things like, for instance, if Ola England does a, 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 a a uh, metal zone pedal. I'll get all these metal zone questions. And if, you know, some YouTube channel talks about this or, if, you know, if Gibson files bankruptcy or something happens that tends to generate more of the emails and they become like you start seeing the trend of what people are asking you and this week i don't know what started it but i got a lot of emails about marketing and bs and confusion about things companies say and um i think i know where it started from so let me tell you where i think the the the, the emails generated from the the core of it as you guys uh, may know, if you're watching the show last week, Nathan gave me the most amazing gift ever. You guys were witnessed that live with me. And uh, and then uh, I called Nathan after the show and talked to Nathan and told Nathan that I wanted to, to make a video. And I told you guys I'd make it like by Saturday. And then I just thought about it going, that's not fair. That's not a proper thank you. So I wanted to spend the time on the video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Taking the time to thank each person and actually document this for me milestone occasion i've never had anything like that happening before uh that gracious that grand so again thank you again to nathan for sure uh man i still still overwhelmed but uh what i was gonna say was um i think a lot of you got excited about prs right nathan works at prs it's all prs stuff i saw a lot of people going i want to buy my first prs and that's that's cool it's great to see energy uh and uh, i'm glad that nathan created that energy and that's even better um but i think a lot of you when you start with surfing looking at prs there was a lot of questions about the tci pickups and the you know the tune capacitance con tune compact <laughs> what's wrong with me tune capacitance inductance say that twice as fast pickups and some of the stuff and and uh anyways and then i got more questions this week and it seems like a lot of questions about marketing uh terminology and i thought that we got to bring this up on the show we got to talk about this this is one of my pet peeves uh i understand the, the the means of marketing and i definitely understand the benefits of dumbing things down so most people can can understand it and i think in marketing sense if you want to dumb something down so that the average person who's not paying attention understands uh I love that. In fact, you know, sometimes my channel is predicated on that whole concept of, hey, how do I get somebody to understand a concept in three to six minutes where I know they're not going to watch 60 minutes of me talking about this one subject. Um, but sometimes marketing just the opposite. It confuses you and sometimes it's just pure BS. So I figured, you know what, instead of doing a video about BS marketing, 
I thought, let's just bring it up on the live show and have you guys ask me uh, what you guys think and stuff. And uh, so to answer the question that I was asked this week about TCI pickups, tune, capacitance, inductance with Powered Smith, is that real? Uh, it's real in the sense, and I'm don't worry, I will, I'll give you the plain truthful answer, but I want to give you this, just this caveat, or not caveat, just this one little precursor. It's true in the same idea that Fender says, hey, we picked that speaker for that amp. And Marshall says, hey, we picked this speaker for this amp. Paul's, Paul Reed Smith Guitars has put a beautiful marketing idea around the idea of like, hey, yeah, we picked out the right pickups for the right guitars. <laughs> Now, there is a lot of truth to the capacitance, inductance, and, and there's more to pickups than just, you know, um, the, the milliamps or the ohms or the, uh, you know, the type of material, whether it's Alnico 2, Alnico uh, 5, if it's ceramic. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff like that. But it's not that it's BS, per se. It's, uh, well, I, the, the pickups are real. So that's what I'm saying. He, he makes a great pickup. That's for sure. He's he's done that. He's achieved the goal. Okay, especially if you're a longtime PRS fan. We used to not love PRS pickups as a, as a community. If you remember, people used to buy three thousand dollar PRSs twenty years ago, and the first thing they did was put different pickups in them, and and so much so that it actually irritated PRS guitars uh, in the idea that. It, you know, they didn't like the idea of that. No one likes the idea that you buy their product and then immediately swap things out. Trust me, I know that more than anybody because let me tell you this, no company wants me to do a sharp on my axe about their product. But I don't know if you guys wear that. I talk about sharp on my axe and how hard it is to get sponsors. You understand, I've told you guys this before. No company thinks it's cool that I want to take their guitar and go, this is how you make it better. They're like, our guitar is better. What are you doing? <laughs> so uh, so anyways, uh, yeah, it's marketing BS for the whole, uh, whole of it. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with saying that. Everybody's got the right to put a spin on something. So it's a spin. So let's talk about what other spins there are. And uh, let's talk about this. And the first uh, question I see uh, is, uh, is, psh, sometimes I don't listen to my tough talk. Uh, <laughs> it's from Christopher who says, hey, Phil, Fender released the new Confi, kind of boy, say that wrong and you're going to be in trouble. Uh, it's a, it's C U N I F E, Confi. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. Wide range pickups. Uh, small builders say it's about design, not alloy. Fender claims otherwise. What's true? Well, you know, true. I hate that word because this is all opinion based, but there's some information I can give you. So the, Capital C, small U, capital N, small I, capital F, small E is, uh, it's for, um, it's to break down the fact that they're cobalt, uh, nickel, and, um, and iron, right? Which is a different makeup than what you would see in an Al Nico, uh, magnet, uh, pickup, right? Okay. And so basically a couple things to know about those pickups. First, uh, they were actually invented or partially invented by Seth Lover. Now I say partially, I just don't know what Fender had their involvement in it, but because you guys think Seth Lover, you think Gibson, but Seth Lover made the pickups for Gibson. But then many, many years later, when Fender's like, we need humbuckers too, they, they had him design those pickups. So they were designed by him, but they are special. And here's why. In fact, uh, uh, my understanding, and again, I'm going to give you my understanding. My understanding is that Fender's reissuing this pickup for the first time. I will tell you this. It probably takes somebody as big as Fender to reissue this pickup properly. I mean, I know I've seen other smaller builders or mid-sized builders do their versions of it, which are very good. But uh, the special part of those uh, cobalt uh, nickel iron pickups uh, magnets is that they what they did is they made the magnet out of the material because they didn't want to use a ceramic bar and just put steel slug. So when you think of a humbucker, you think of a steel slug or screw, and then you see a magnet stuck to that, and that magnetizes that metal. The actual the screws in those pickups are the magnets, and so you have to machine the the magnet into a threaded screw. Um, so you can't do that with uh, Al Nico. It will crack. It's very brittle. Cr ever mess with Al Nico? It's very brittle. Now keep in mind, I've never really machined any of this stuff. I only know like history information. Uh, some stuff I can tell you from a practical knowledge, like oh yeah, I've tried it. But pickups, I've done so much stuff with pickups, winding them, and 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 doing all kinds of creative stuff with pickups. But there are certain things uh, like I just can't get my hands on. I've never really took apart one of those vintage ones. Are worth oh you could go like a thousand bucks for a set of vintage. Uh, uh, pickups from those vendors. Um, 
as high as that. I'm not buying a set of those and cutting them open just for my curiosity. <laughs> but so is it special? Um, well, here's the bigger argument. Is it special? I don't know, because I'd have to actually like with the Somnium guitar, compare the the fake ones, because let's put it this way. I don't mean fake ones or new ones are fake. They've been fake since the 70s, okay? Somewhere around the early 70s, and again, this is all, you know, you can Wikipedia this stuff, you don't need me, <laughs> but I can get, at least give you the guidelines of what you're supposed to look for. In the 70s, approximately, uh, Fender stopped making the real ones and started making these fake ones, which are just, basic, when I say fake, they're humbuckers like that had padding and they just made the pickups look bigger and it's like a facade kind of a thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, did people notice? It's one of those things. Did the first person notice because they heard a difference or did they notice because they saw a difference or because somebody tried to sell them the old one and say it's better? Sometimes there's a lot of, vintage guitars are 50% amazing reality and 50% BS. I know I keep saying BS. I feel like a third grade school teacher can't say the words, but come on, we're gonna keep it clean. But my point is, it's BS. You know what I mean? It's all about some some guy, and I hate to say guy because usually it's it, it's always a guy, right? I don't know. Maybe there's one girl out there doing it, one woman. Uh, but there's always some guy telling you, oh, I got a blah, blah, blah guitar, and they've never made them like that since. And, and I always call BS on that because... I'm gonna stop seeing BS. <laughs> I, I call I call that crap because here's here's the reality. There are some things it's true that they can't make anymore. That's true, right? Things change, laws change, uh, manufacturing changes. They physically don't make the materials like they used to. Um, sometimes it's it's like I said, it's OSHA laws or or uh, it's uh, regulations that change the process. Sometimes it's just forgotten knowledge. It happens. And yes, could the old piece of technology or piece of gear in the guitar world be somehow more magical than the new reissue? Yeah, but a lot of times, a lot of that stuff was left behind because it wasn't very good. And that's where, the, that's where it gets confusing. There are some things that we as musicians left behind because we found a better alternative. It was better, <laughs> right? Um, and then some things, uh, you know, we, they replaced it because like I said, times change and laws change and things like that. So you have to kind of look at that and figure out where is that coming from on that pickup? One thing I always thought about was it's designed a little differently in the size and all that stuff. So that has as much to do with the materials. So to, to get to your core question, I'm sorry, I've taken so long, but it's just an interesting part of this subject since this is the theme of today's video. Uh, it, it's, uh, it says small builders say the design, it's the design, not the alloys. I would say the same. Okay. Uh, I would say that here's what my, my theory would be. Okay. Cause it's a theory at this point. I haven't done actual tests. My theory is that if you build a pickup physically like that, in other words, size wise, space it out because the, where we know, we all know this, nobody has to convince you that moving a pickup up and down where the, to the neck, to the bridge changes the sound. If you don't understand that, well then I don't, you need to start with some really basic YouTube videos or something or, or go back, but then no one's arguing that. <laughs> no one's arguing like, hey, if I put a pickup in the bridge position, it sounds different than the neck. No one's going, nope, they sound the same. It's crazy. Just put one pickup in the guitar. No, they, we know that they sound different physically where we put the, the, the pickups. And we also know that changing the distance between the how wide, like wide range or narrow field. Uh, Paul Reed Smith has a pickup called narrow field. That's his, his fancy way of saying a mini humbucker, <laughs> right? Good, again, good marketing. It's a narrow field. It's a field, a narrow field of range that just picks up the pickup. It's a mini humbucker. No, no, it's narrow. It's, it's, it's not wide. <laughs> marketing. So, but still, doesn't matter. Still, under, we understand. I did a video we, 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 uh, where I physically tested it. We took a mini humbucker in the same guitar, put it in, played it, pulled it out, put the full size humbucker. Supposed to be spec the same by the manufacturer. In other words, designed to be the same, sound similar. They sounded massively different. Although I could argue they were using different magnets and different wire, and I think that had to factor in. I'd say 90% of the reason it was different is because physically it was just a different range of, of a spectrum of what it was hearing from the string. I would say, could you go out and buy a set of these pickups from Fender for $400? I think it's like four or $500 for the set from Fender reissue. Sure. Could you get a similar sound with a less expensive pickup that's just a wider, like a wide range pickup. Yeah, I think the average, I think the average listener that's not educated, uh, when I say educated, I mean, uh, I like the word connoisseur. Sometimes when people go, oh, you hear the difference? Look, 
you don't always have to hear the difference. You don't always have to feel the difference or see the difference. You know what I mean? You understand that if you're into something, something excites you, whether that's, uh, you know, sports or music or, or food or, or, you know, wine, because I said connoisseur and people think of wine when they think connoisseurs. Uh, if you want to educate yourself about every detail, uh, there's a YouTube video that I, that I love, okay? It's probably, and I'll put a link in it. It's one of my favorite YouTube videos of all YouTube videos at all time. I don't know why some crazy YouTuber did a great video. He wanted to know how much sawdust could he put in a Rice Krispie treat before people noticed it. So he made a bunch of batches of Rice Krispie che treats with different, um, different amounts of le edible, meaning edible, not poisonous, amounts of sawdust in them. And he fed them to his friends, including the last one, which was like 90% sawdust and 10% Rice Krispie, to see when they noticed there was sawdust and it was what you expected. It was like number two or three, you know, when it was like 40% sawdust, they were like, this doesn't taste like a Rice Krispie anymore. <laughs> but my, my point is I would imagine if you were a connoisseur of something, if you were educated on it and you spent your time apparently eating Rice Krispie treats every day, you would detect it in the first bite, the first one, right? Uh, that which which you'd hope. So sometimes connoisseurs are educated people in a subject that can detect things like hear the difference between the design of a pickup and the actual makeup of the pickups and hearing those small differences, maybe that matters. But in the grand scheme, my, my theory is I think the average player is not gonna detect uh, a huge difference from the, the, the comfy <laughs> pickup. Uh, but I don't know. Like I said, it's, that's why I like try. It's know your gear is the name of the channel because I want to try things. Uh, I'd be willing to try a set of the vintage or the vintage correct ones versus the fake correct ones and see. But I would. I'm gonna guess that my I'm I'm close to right. That they'll sound so similar that uh, even if the the expensive ones sound better, I don't know. So. There you go. There's my answer to your question. It was a good question. Good answer. Today, I brought a coffee mug. I'm drinking water, of course, or vodka, like I always say, uh, from the Artistic Autistic. Uh, I just, every time I see this, I always, this is, uh, this is one of my favorite cups. I just thought I'd give a shout out again. I'll put a link right now when I index this to his channel. So, um, so what else? That was a super chat. Let's do a non super chat question to something <laughs> question mark first uh james says hey phil that's me uh what's your thought on the sales pitch that zagger guitars are easy play marketing bs that is that company is getting crazier by the by the by the minute Okay. Uh, 10 years ago ish. And again, I'm doing it all from memory. 10 years ago is when I think the first time I ever heard of the Zagger guitars, you know, it's like he wrote the, the song, the guy Zagger, uh, Zager, whatever, wrote the song and, uh, and, uh, started making these easy play guitars. And don't get me wrong. At first I was impressed on the marketing. I was like, easy play, easy to play. It's an easy play system. Great. Lower the action. It's easier to play. It's the easy play system. Right. It's like, it's like somebody going, Hmm, did, uh, did you get your car washed? No, I got it. Shine technology. <laughs> right. I don't know. I was okay. So anyways, uh, so, but I love the concept in the idea. It's like, okay, here's what he's doing in my opinion. Cause I got to say in my opinion, cause if I'm wrong, I don't want to get in you know, trouble. Uh, cause I don't know what he's doing. Why? Because they're extremely secretive company. Okay. Uh, it doesn't take I think a couple, if you're a diehard, weird guitar cre uh, creep, <laughs> creep like me, no, if you're a diehard <laughs> a guitar freak like me, sometimes you end up in these like two to three hour rabbit holes in the middle of the night in the internet and Zagger, Zager, whatever, ends up becoming one of those rabbit holes. And if you ever want to see and try to figure out what's going on with that company, it, it's a very just close. They're, they don't tell you anything. It, it's like, think about this. Are they made in the USA or, and then they're even vague. They're kind of assembled in the USA. Well, assembled is so loosely described when they're talking that it kind of implies like if they take the strings off and put new strings on and tuning keys, they're going to like, it's assembled in the USA. So where am I going with this? I'm going with this. Um, 
So basically, you take uh, guitars from Indonesia, which is nothing wrong, or China, because it's where everybody buys their guitars. And when you get them, instead of opening them up, inspecting them, make sure the factory did it right, you pull them out and you do a full setup on them. And uh, sometimes a full setup means the crown level some frets or take care of a high issue. You guys have seen a Sharpen My Axe? He's sharpening my axe. He's the original Sharpen My Axe guy, right? Let's give him credit. He was like, hey, I'm going to take an acoustic and fix it up. Except for here's the crazy part. When you're looking at the guitars, some of them are $2,500. It's like somebody going, okay, I'm going to sell you a $700 acoustic, and then I'm going to charge you $1,800 to make it play great. But I mean, it comes with like stickers and a t-shirt. Don't get me wrong, in a case. I mean, those are, have value too. <laughs> uh, so no, it it is creepy uh, how creepy it is. It it It's like info late night Marshall crap converted to guitar. Um, now, so you know, I never proclaim to be right. <laughs> so what I'm going to tell you is this, because uh, these episodes always get about, you know, 15 to 20,000 views or not always. I shouldn't say that, you know, like cocky like that, but it's likely. And the podcast will do at least that or more. Um, if the Zegger guys hear me, I, I will pay with, I will pay to fly to your facility. I will film a video and I will be totally unbiased. I will literally be there to do exactly what I've done many times before. I would love to share the Zager history and company with you guys. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, as long as they're willing to, uh, you know, take the chance that, you know, if they're full of crap, it's going to come out. But I would do it, right? Um, I'll tell you what I wouldn't want really willing to do. I wouldn't be willing for them to ship me a guitar and have me review it. Not that they would ever ask to do that, but I'm just saying I wouldn't be willing to do that on the video on a video because um, that doesn't tell me anything. I've seen, see, here's the thing. I've seen ish things. I've seen where like, I've seen stickers in their guitars placed <sighs> kind of, again, like I said, I want to be clear how I'm saying this stuff. It appeared to be very creepily put, placed over where the manufacturing guitar was made. So it was like a Zager sticker over made in Indonesia. Um, now some of that stuff could be people, uh, trolling and putting fake stuff up on the internet, but I'm talking about what I've personally seen. I've personally seen stuff. Now I've personally worked on two Zager guitars and this again, this was a long time ago. So it could have been a different company by then, not different ownership, but you know, companies grow and improve. Those guitars were, uh, those at that time, I, I believe, and I'll pick up, I'll just think of the one, an example, one of them, the, the customer paid, I think they said $700 with the case and my expert opinion, although they had a, I think at that time they're like my local luthier said he says guitars are 10 times the prices well i was the local luthier and i looked at it and i saw basically a 399 dollars acoustic with a brand name it means it would be 400 dollars if it had like a fender logo on it a brand name and so it was marked up higher than i felt the you know than what usually brands off brands would get and it was all off this market off this easy play system so it is a little creepy in the fact that it seems to be marketed towards people in that way but again that's how it appears and again it appears that way because when you go to get clear easy answers off their website or off the internet which let's be clear is should be very easy to do is it made in the usa yes these models are proudly made in the usa these mo models are proudly imported or unproudly imported whatever they want to say and uh it, you know and this is what the company is one of my favorite things about them was they used to post pictures of this shop in their ads um, like of building guitars, but I, but w there's no footage of building guitars. Just show a factory footage. Again, it's, it's very creepy because we're talking about marketing BS. The number one thing the one, and I think is the worst thing when we talk about marketing BS, the number one thing that upsets me is when companies allude to be made in the USA. Um, because I don't, I know people from other countries sometimes like no one cares if it's made in the USA. Well, you know what? A lot of people do. And the market knows that a lot of people know they pay more it has nothing to do with guitars. Okay. Uh, I believe new balance. And again, I'm just going off of a memory here. New balance, I think got in trouble for, uh, some of their shoes saying they were made in America where they were essentially just mostly made overseas and then finished here in, in the States. And I believe they got in trouble for that. Now, again, I'm, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I just remember reading something about that. Um, again, I got to do this stuff off of memory of an article I wrote, a few, I, I read a few years ago, but that's not the point. The point is, is that we all know made in USA, uh, has value. Here's how we know it has value because everyone goes out of their way to not show when it's made somewhere else. Now I don't mean Germany or Japan, other countries that are also notorious for having uh, great quality craftsmanship. I mean, let's be, let's be clear. China is not 
uh, nothing, I don't want to say nothing wrong, but with China, Indonesia, uh, and Vietnam, companies, com com countries that are building our products uh, in those places inexpensively, that is the, that is the I want to say the get. In other words, people are buying those products there, like Harley Benton stuff, because it's affordable. Okay, so so a lot of times, like manufacturers of make things will put. Sometimes you ever ever had to, I I've looked at products for like ten minutes once to figure out where it says it's made. But uh, let me tell you something: if it's made in the USA, you don't have to look for it. It's going to be apparent. <laughs> it's going to be stamped into there somewhere or stuck on the box. So the reason I say that is is it's because n not because of uh, the pride of the per of the factory making the U.S. Although that's a part of it. Um, and yeah, Sean Brooks, by the way, is saying, what about UK Marshall? Same thing, right? When it's made in UK and Marshall, it'll have the made in UK and backwards made in UK sticker on the front of the amp. But the made in Vietnam series, it doesn't have a big Vietnamese flag with <laughs> made in Vietnam on the front of the amp. And again, it's because people are willing to pay more for and I'm saying for some reason because everybody has different reasonings for that. And I don't want to go through them. But people are willing to pay more. And because people are willing to pay more, right, uh, they will be fraudulent sometimes and sometimes make it allude to that, like assembled in the U.S., which, again, I don't want to go through that, uh, what's the the hierarchy of this stuff, but you get to understand understand that. So Zager, to me, back to Zager, which is I think they seem to imply they're doing more than what they say. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, so uh, to back to the Zager guy. Uh, yeah, Peter says <laughs> Zager's website says is proud to tell you Mike Huggaby plays Zager. Yeah, well they they have all these strange uh, uh, endorsements that are you know I mean obviously they have notoriety but I mean obviously Huckabee's like a politician kind of guy but you get the idea. We it's a weird vibe is what I'm trying to say. But instead of condemning it or making fun of it. I just tell you, I'm venting my, because you brought it up, I'm venting what I see as a problem. I really feel like that if you bought a $2,500 Zager guitar, in my opinion, it was a horrible mistake and you shouldn't have done it. And if you did do it, I have done, I bought speakers off a guy off of, uh, you know, Craigslist that didn't work once. I mean, you know what I mean? We do dumb things, okay? You have to eat your money and go. If you haven't done it, think about it. <laughs> okay. What I'm saying is, is, is that uh, when I was just recently looking at Zager guitars and looking at the price points, I'm telling you there are some amazing Taylors, Martins, hold on, what, any water, and other very nice brands that you can buy. And, not, and, and don't worry, Easy Play can be applied to any guitar. So I'd love to see if they have a patent on Easy Play. Not a trademark on the name, that I can believe. I'd love to see a patent. But like I said, I'm willing to eat crow, <laughs> be wrong, admit it. Like I said, I've admitted wrong many times. It happens a lot sometimes, more than I want it to. Um, but I would. I'd pay out of my own pocket to go and film there. I'll film there. I'll, we'll talk about it. I'll give them a fair shake. Everything will be discussed. You know what I mean? Because, um, again, I hope I'm wrong. I don't want to. I don't want to think that companies are taking advantage of people, but it just doesn't feel right. Doesn't look right. And I've said this before. When it talks to buying stuff on Craigslist and stuff, go with your gut, right? If it doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. Zager guitars never felt right to me. That's my opinion. So there you go. Um, yeah. But on that note, <laughs> so uh, great. Uh, uh, <laughs> David Bruce says, do you have to buy, do you have to buy it on easy guitar plan? Yeah, you probably do. Uh, and then, oh, C, C Burgess. Okay. So C Burgess said this great thing. He says, how did Zager modify other brands as now easy to play guitars? So I, my, again, I'm, I'm my understanding. Cause I, I didn't really like, you know, I don't, I, I wasn't involved in really paying attention as the Zager thing uh, started. But if I remember correctly, it didn't even start as a brand of guitars. They started as like they were taking some inexpensive price guitars and fixing them up, which at, that's what I said. At first, it seemed like a very almost noble concept. It would be like imagine a small mom pop store took all their hundred dollar Squire Epiphone esque whatever sunlight guitars and started putting sixty dollar setups on them, which is really like a great idea. You know what I mean? Um, it, it, if you could do it, if you could pull it off. Okay. Um, we would do in our shop, we would do this deal where if you bought a guitar from us and sign up for lessons, we would set them up. 
because that was the incentive. We couldn't make money on the damn guitar. We'd sell a guitar for 150. At 150, we would buy the guitar at like 105. We'd make $45. I was charging it at that time at, you know, I like I said, 70 bucks for a setup. It didn't make any sense. But if you paid for a month of lessons at 100 bucks, the store would make like $30 on that, right? You know, 25, 30 bucks on that, add that to the kitty. And then I would do the setup, which at that point we broke even, but the very next month we would make our $25. And we and if you stayed and you're successful, we would see the dividend of that. And then you would buy another guitar and more things. So it was investing. We could do it in an investment logic to, to, to do that. And we would pull it off sometimes because it was tough. Cause it's like, you know, a lot of people buy cheap, the cheap people who it's weird. People who usually buy the cheapest guitars aren't gonna buy lessons. I know what you're thinking. If you only have a hundred bucks, you don't have money for lessons. That's usually not how it works. It's usually the cheapest guitar concept of buying in, in a music store is the parent. It's the parent causing the problem, right? It's like, uh, you know, and you try what you can, but you know, they come in and they're like, Timmy wants to play guitar. Little Julie wants to play guitar. What, what, what do you got for $53? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> You know, uh, so you know what I mean? I, um, I remember like, I remember I would have guys come in and go, how much is this guitar? I'd be like $3,800 and they go, Oh, but I'd have moms in the store and I'm like, how much is the guitar package? And I'm like, well, it's 159. And they're like, Oh my God, 159. And I'm like, yeah, for the amp, the guitar, the cables, the gig. Pack. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyways, uh, so yeah, uh, I'm getting, I'm getting sidetracked. I feel <laughs> So, um, what were, where, where were we? Zagger guitars. Yeah. So the easy play system. Yeah. I believe they did it at other guitars. And again, easy play is a setup. I think that's a interesting. And like I said, I don't mind the, the terminology. I think the terminology in the marketing of the easy play idea is ingenious. You make a guitar easy to play, right? By setting it up a little better or lowering the action or changing a little bit. So it's a little easier to play. Makes perfect sense. However, the rest of it seems a little, little, little strange, right? A little strange. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Jeff Parker says, where do you draw the line? This is interesting. Uh, and this ties, to, again, we're still on the same subject of manufacturers and marketing because this, uh, I'm sure this will tie in. He says, where do you draw the line? Uh, most Floyd Rose guitar bridges are made in Germany. Uh, yep, they're made by Schaller if they're made in Germany. Uh, so if a guitar is made in the USA and has a Floyd Rose, is it no longer made in the USA? Um, well, again, again, uh, there is... There is terminology out there that usually helps people understand this, like a certain percentage of a product was made in a country, therefore it's made in that country. California is even, is really difficult because they really demand a high amount. It used to be like 100% or some crazy like that for a short time. They, they made some real le hard legislation and then they backed it off. Um, so much so that where you guys realize it in California, Fender, if you buy a Fender American Strat right now, it doesn't say made in the USA. Go, go look if you just bought one, you're on your headstock, you're, if you haven't figured it out yet, they don't say made in the USA on Fender headstocks, on the Fender strats and tellies. They say Corona, California. They don't say made in USA. Um, I, I think that, I, again, I think the reason they did that was when the leg legislation got really harsh, because like I said, for a, it was, you guys, people from California could probably uh, cue in a little bit in the comments. Uh, the way I remember it was they, they passed this legislation that said that basically, you know, if it's not 100% made in the USA, you can't make it in the USA. And, uh, and then that was like almost impossible. So no one could make anything in the USA. And so a lot of manufacturers were threatening to leave California going, hey, man, if I can't, if I'm going to build a guitar 90% here, but 10% import parts and I can't say made in the USA, I'm, I'm just going to go overseas. You know what I mean? I don't, that, that really didn't happen. They didn't really threaten it like that way, but that was the argument. And then California like backed it off a little bit because I remember uh, all of a sudden it changed. Um, some of the some of the terminology changed, but I think Fender at that point just said, "Screw it, we're just going to leave <laughs> Corona California or Corona, yeah, Corona California on the headstocks and just call it a day." Um, so, uh, so yeah, so uh, so where does that line happen where something's made? I think I think it should be an obvious thing, is what I'm uh, is my opinion. Okay, again, I don't want to go about what the laws are. I want to go off what I feel. Here's how I feel. I think all of us know, like, here's, here's, here's a good way to look at this. 
if if you go if you're if you make food if you make dinner tonight you know how if you really made dinner or if you reheated something <laughs> okay right we use the term i made dinner very loosely <laughs> as a society like i made dinner tonight what'd you do pregu salsa noodles spaghetti <laughs> right did you really make dinner i mean technically you made dinner <laughs> Right. Oh, I added some garlic powder and some salt. So I did make it. It's my special recipe. Um, so same logic. Right. I think everybody deep down knows what really, you know what I mean? When you really make something versus when you, you know, you just put the finishing bow on it and then said, yeah, it's made here. Um, but that's not even what I'm arguing. I'm ar arguing the total flat out, not even lie. You know what I mean? Uh, just the flat out like misleading you by saying like, uh, here's a misleading, here's a marketing term that I love that I see so much designed in the USA, made in whatever, right? Uh, UK's too, by the way, De designed in U United Kingdom, made in Vietnam. It's truthful, but it's marketing, right? Um, there you go. So again, there's marketing terms and I don't think that's made, I don't really feel like that was made to trick you into thinking like, oh, it's made in the UK. And then you're like, uh, no, 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 it's not. It says it's designed in the UK. And you're like, oh, I thought I said made. I mean, yeah, you might have that confusion, but I think most people, they read designed in UK, made in Vietnam. I think in this today's day and age, we know what that means. Like, right, they made the prototype, they sent the prototype over to Vietnam, they mass produced it. But the company that that owns the product, at least developed the product versus what's called a repackage where basically they were in a Vietnamese factory and they're like, what are you making over there? And they're like, we make these uh, amps for Joe, Joe, yo, and, and he, and Harley Bitten. And like Marshall's like, cool, put our name on those two and give us 60,000 of them. Like that's a different concept, right? Repackaging an existing product. Uh, toy collectors know what repacks are probably more than anyone. Cause the toy industry is like the most, I think no, most notorious for repackage. So, all right. Uh, and then Eddie, thank you, Eddie. What a great question. I love these kind of chats on these uh, on these uh, subjects because uh, you, a great question. He says, why don't manufacturers state where the guitar is made on the instrument? And he says, why don't they? Um, well, they do, but sometimes you're right. Sometimes they don't. Why don't they? Well, uh, <laughs> Well, we know why they don't. Uh, so, so uh, I just thought it was funny that you asked it like that. Why, like in other words, why wouldn't they want to? Um, well, we know if it was made in the USA or U United Kingdom or Japan or Germany. Uh, and again, if I'm forgetting your country, don't get offended. It's just, it's just we. It's again, it, we know what countries push higher price points and that's what it is think of it like cars so no one gets offended in the united states a bmw costs more than a ford <laughs> right we don't have to argue anything that's just a fact bmws cost more than fords that's a fact in the guitar community american-made guitars cost more than chinese-made guitars as a whole don't i know somebody out there is going to be determined to find well this one chinese guitar is more than this one. yeah there's exceptions but uh, just like there's a Ford truck that costs more than a BMW, there's exceptions, but we're talking about as a whole. So as a whole, c companies want to dissuade, I don't know if dissuade's the right word. Companies want to unhighlight <laughs> the things that are not going to help the guitars uh, get a higher price. I, that's my way of saying that. And highlight the things that will. Uh, and then Joey says, is Fender Custom Shop marketing BS or is it worth the price tag? I, I, I proudly say this. I've said this now for many years. I own a Fender Custom Shop. It's one of my main guitars. I love it, and it's BS. <laughs> uh, I, say, I know that sounds contradictory, but here's what it is. I wanted it. I bought it. I do like it. I've never bought another Custom Shop again. It's not because they're not quality. They're great quality. One of Fender's faults is their strengths, in my mind. Fender is a company. I always felt this way. Fender is a company that can make you great inexpensive stuff. So because they make great inexpensive stuff, like Mexican Strat's fantastic, American Standard Strat, uh, well, you know, professional and, and, and uh, performer and all that stuff are fantastic. So Custom Shop Strat, when somebody's like, oh, my Custom Shop Strat's way better. I'm like, well, mine, it's better, <laughs> way better. Mine's not way better, by the way. My, my uh, Custom Shop Strat is 
spec the way I want them. In other words, it, it's it, like I said, it's the color I wanted with the features I wanted, which is painted headstock and it has a 12 inch radius fretboard. It has some features that I specifically wanted on the guitar and ordered that way. That is something that really doesn't Fender doesn't even do anymore. Custom shop Fender now is still off the rack. It's just off a higher expensive rack. So I'll tell you what I think is funny about Fender Custom Shop. The name custom is weird. Fender Custom Shop to me is like, if you've ever had this experience where you go to a custom builder for a house, you know, you, go, you, go, you, you and the, the missus or you and the mister uh, decide to go, hey, let's go look at those houses we can't afford. Because, you know, sometimes you do that. And uh, you go to these houses and it's custom homes. And you're in there and you're like, you know, and you, you, you go in there and you're like, you're looking at the home. And you're like, this is nice. And like, and what features can we get on this? And like, oh, you can get the cabinets in this color or this color. And you're like, and all of a sudden you start realizing these custom expensive homes are now what they call semi-custom where there's a little bit of plug and play um <laughs> we were in a house i'll never forget this we were in a house and it was crazy expensive in arizona it was nuts it was off the charts expensive and one of the things my wife asked was because it it had it had three bathrooms and it was beautiful home and uh my wife just asked in passing the the not you know the agent the person that's showing the model home She's like, um, but all the bathroom showers. And she's like, yeah. And she goes, and the master, can you get a tub? And she's like, no, to get a tub, what you'd have to do is you buy the house the way we make it. And then afterwards you can get a, like a plumber to come and rip the shower out and just install your own bathtub. And that was a custom home builder. <laughs> So that's how I think of Fender Custom Shop. It's like, wow, I love strats. I always wanted one special. Can I get a strat this way? And they're like, well, we'll dig, we'll, we'll ding it up. We'll scratch it. <laughs> we'll put some cool pickups in it. And you can pick seven colors. So again, cookie cutter custom. Thank you, Christopher. Yeah, it's cook, cut, Fender. Cut. And so, you know, every insult I have is never meant to be, uh, uh, Again, I'm not trying to slam Fender for this because <laughs> I understand why they do it. I don't like it, but I understand it. Why? Because Fender sells gazillions of those things. So if anyone goes, why are they so stupid? Well, they're so stupid laughing to the bank. That's why they're so stupid. So, all right. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Guitar1952 says custom shop necks are much are gener generally much better. Yes, they are better because all guitars are better the more hand time on them. That's a fact. There's just no way around that. No one's been able to disprove that. Let me give you an example. Like I said, you go to factories and here's something, here's an, something you notice about all factories. They pull it out of the machine and you're impressed. They're like, oh, they made a body and then they made a neck and they fit it in. Everybody's seen this video. There's like every factory does it. They're like I made this neck on this machine, and this body and watch this. And you stick it in the pocket and they go, no glue or anything. It sticks in perfectly. That's how tight the tolerances are. And we always go, ooh. And then you pick up that guitar and you're like, yeah, I wouldn't freaking play this thing. This doesn't play. It doesn't feel great yet. It won't feel great until somebody's hands are, are sanding on it and finishing it. It's the finish time. Do you know why a cheap guitar has such horrible fret ends? Because it takes it takes 20 minutes. I was going to say 15, but really it takes 20. To do a fret end dress, I did a fret end dress on Dobie Doss's guitar in that video. That fret end dress, obviously I only give you the highlights of the fret end dress, but I think I said in there, the fret end dress I did on that guitar was about 11 to 15 minutes. That's how fast it takes me with one of those files just to go and just polish off the front ends, okay? So if you hand me a guitar right now, I, I, I do it for, for people all the time. I can do it anytime you want. I can front end dress your guitar, pretty much any guitar, uh, let's say 20 minutes in front of you, right? And just polish off the front ends, okay? So obviously that's not because uh, magic, that's because I've done a lot of them. Somebody who's doing it all day in a factory are gonna probably even be faster than me. Cause again, uh, you know, I'm. I'm doing one a day, two a day. They're doing 40, 50 a day. So here's the problem. 20 minutes is a long time in a manufacturing process. 20 minutes is horrendous. It's a 20 minutes on a guitar that's going to, a guitar that's going to street for $169 to have an employee spend 20 minutes on one thing on that guitar. And that thing is just to make sure the frets feel nice is, is a very hard thing to justify in pricing, even at whatever the, the, labor wages that everybody talks about you know like hey, oh the wage late the late the um 
wages are slave labor wages. I'm like, yeah, and that tells you something. Even at those wages, it's impossible to put that hands on the guitar that long. So custom shop guitars as a whole should always be better because somebody is supposed to have their hands on them for much longer. In fact, some companies, and I think Fender's one of them, will flat out tell you when you go there, that's what it is. They, they'll tell you the time factor. There's a, like, you know, on this guitar, they spend, let's say, 15 minutes fret dressing it and, and doing the fret and the the, uh, the neck. And then on this guitar, they spend, you know, 20 minutes and on this guitar. Um, Nathan, as you guys know Nathan, because he gave me a guitar, Nathan told me once, and it made total sense, that when he's buffing PRS guitars, uh, um, and he's probably in the comments, so if I'm wrong, Nathan, please correct me. I think he was saying he has to spend an hour or an hour and a half on a core guitar, but only like 30 minutes on an S2. I think something like that, buffing. And that's the same job. So think about it, he's buffing. So he's obviously, he's he's handing a guitar, a core guitar to somebody after he's buffed it that's supposed to be like glass and perfect. And the S2 is very good, right? Same thing. That's just how they got to factor that in. So yes, uh, guitar 1952, I agree with you. Custom shop necks are generally much better. And that's why I'm saying custom shop guitars are going to be good. But the question is, you know, how good is that price and how and how exciting or not exciting? How exclusive is that? It's not very exclusive as a whole, in my opinion. Uh, OK, uh, let's I've been ignoring some questions. <laughs> so let me get to some real quick. Hold on a second. Let me refresh. Good time to drink some water. I feel like I'm just constantly drinking water on the show, but I am just constantly talking. Okay. Uh, okay. Matt Wells says, Hey, Phil, I love the vintage sound, but most vintage guitars are out of my price range. Do you think it's ever worth paying big sums of money for vintage pickups like, uh, like PAFs, uh, to try to get the sound? Um, I, I, I have played vintage PAFs. I played vintage pickups. That's something I can definitely tell you, uh, that I've done not only played vintage guitars, but I've, I've literally had intimate time with all kinds of exciting pickups to, through, through my store years, through the YouTube years, you know, I mean, you know, uh, so, uh, there is something uh, great about the pickups, the fact that they're old and the, the magnets have softened and the different materials and the way they constructed them, whether they're sand cast or the newer ways they make them that are more kind of polished and perfect now. So my answer to you is this, yes, vintage pickups are really good. And I, uh, love <laughs> most of the ones I've played. They most all have some kind of, I would say sweetness that I love. It doesn't even matter if I'm talking about single coils out of a Strat or PAFs uh, out of a Gibson or something like that. But what I will tell you is this, there are tons of builders out there that spend insane amount of time <laughs> figuring out the magic, which isn't magic. It's just reverse engineering it. And in my experience, I've come across many of those, um, many times. So to answer your question, Matt, no, I wouldn't buy me personally. I wouldn't pay crazy. I wouldn't pay crazy money for vintage pickups, but I do because I do currently do now pay. Let's say way higher than what the market trend of pickups are to get special pickups from special builders, and that's why when I did the um, the Doctor Octave pickups, that's why I highlighted those. I'll highlight small builders like him because what happens is is you learn. This is the trick I've learned, and Matt, please take this to heart because it's good information to know. What I've learned is this. What makes a pickup expensive is the builder's reputation. So trying to find the next good builder on a pickup is a magical thing to do because you're going to find the guy who's going to soon get $300 a pickup, and you're going to get him for $79 a pickup. That's what you do. And that's why sometimes it's fun to try pickups from builders. That's, that's why sometimes when a builder's like, it's $150 for the set, I'm like, send them. <laughs> Cause at that point I'm willing to try because if they're great, I'll buy another set immediately. And like I said, uh, uh cause again, you, you know what I mean? There's, uh, the thing, you know, you get the idea. So that's my advice to you, Matt. You could buy the vintage pickups. I would try to find the, the recreations that are really good. I think you'll be fine uh, to the point where I don't know if I would, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to bet money to see if I could hear the difference between the two. Um, let's see. Hold on a second. Uh, Neil says, hey, Phil, I have a chance to buy a, buy two. He's going to buy two guitars. Okay. He's going to buy two. You know this. We, we always tell you to buy the guitar. He's going to buy two 2012 DBZ 
Uh, Barchetta guitars, unused for about $700. They are used as wall display. Okay. What do you think of that model DBZ? The price question mark. Is there anything I should be wary of being unused? Uh, uh, is there anything I should be wary of being unused? Uh, no, I mean, here's the thing. Look, inspect them, visually inspect them and check them. Make sure that there's no issues. Uh, sitting on the walls, collecting dust shouldn't have any issues. Um, nothing should happen from that. The DBZ guitars from 2012, here's what's cool, man. They're made in the world manufacturing so factory. They're made in Korea. So they're very good guitars. They're, and the design's really good. And it looks really cool. Um, I feel like... Okay, I, wanted, I gotta make sure. I, so I'm gonna give you the, both answers because this is important. If you're telling me you can buy two of the guitars for $700, yeah, yeah, 350 guitar, that's a good deal do it. Now, as I say, good deal, not a great deal. I've seen them that cheap. You know what I mean? Uh, when I sold mine, I thought I got 450 for mine. I, th I think so. That seems high. I don't think I got that. I might've tried to, I think I tried to get five. I might've, it's been a while now since I sold mine. Um, when I sold it, I sold it like everybody for what you can. I sold it for what I can keep it in mind that it, I felt it was a much better worth more guitar than the price I was selling it for, but it's what you can get. So 700 doesn't blow me away even for two. 700 for one seems high, but again, I haven't looked at the, you know, reverbs to see what they're selling for. But, uh, you know, if you really like them, 700 for both is, I think it's worth it. In other words, you can try them, enjoy them. One of my favorite things to do, I think a lot of us do it on this, you know, in this community and on this channel is if you can buy a guitar at the right price, you buy it, like I said, I call it park your money. You park your money into the guitar. You play the guitar for a little while. You enjoy it. You sell the guitar. Ha try to think of another situation where you could do that. It's amazing. Could you imagine, like, I bought a TV. I watched sports for, you know, a couple months, and I sell the TV for what I paid. I mean, I know I don't know why TV is a bad analogy, but you get the idea. The whole idea that you can buy something, enjoy it for a little period of time, and if you like it, keep it, but if not, sell it, and then be out nothing is it's not a high risk thing. It's fun to do as a collector. So yeah, I, I, but like I said, 700 piece, I'd say no, 700 for the both. I say, I think you're, you're safe. And I, that's without me looking at the current trends on reverb to see what stuff's going for. Uh, Tom says new Princeton reverb has a hiss above volume four. My other amps don't do it. Mostly goes away when I ground the strings. Is that okay? Just need a noise gate. Uh, I shouldn't need a noise gate, but what I would like you to do for me, Tom, is try and put it at volume four, but turn the reverb, you can turn the tremolo off just to be safe too, but turn the reverb off, okay? Um, so believe it or not, some of those amps, uh, Princeton's, as you know, I have a couple of Princeton's, I like them, but sometimes Fender amps uh, will get a hiss. Um, and sometimes if you're lucky, if it's doing it, so here's the good news, if it's doing it at, and it's your reverb, um, what I would do is pop those, you know, obviously turn the amp off, wait for it to cool down and pop the preamp tubes to your reverb and tremolo. Uh, well, isolate which one's doing it. You should be able to do that. But let's say it's your reverb. Like I said, turn the reverb off. It goes away. Then I would basically get a new tube for the reverb and put a new tube in it. Remember the thing with Fender that sucks is they use, the, in my opinion, the worst tubes ever, which is groove tubes. Um, and I'm just constantly having trouble with groove tubes. So, uh, you know, and, uh, believe it or not, the sad news is it's like, uh, for you guys out here that watch, uh, that watch the show and your it guys, and you know, you have to tell people like, turn the computer off and turn it back on again. Yeah. In the tube world, everything is change your tubes. <laughs> it, it sounds like a cop out. It's not changing your tubes is, is first. You should do that before you ever take it to someone to do anything. Cause just why not change tubes, especially preamp tubes, power tubes is a slightly different conversation but preamp tubes, especially swap them out. Try that first. See, the other thing you have to be aware of is, um, sometimes it's your pedals. So, um, some pedals, especially boss pedals, even when they're turned off they're they'll create the amp to hiss. Like my Mesa boogie freaks out over boss pedals. Uh, if I have boss pedals in the, in the chain, even off, because obviously they're, they're uh, buffered. I'm sure that's what it is. They're driving that. They think make the amp hiss. So another thing I'd like you to check on your amp is please unplug everything but the guitar. So guitar straight to the amp and then try to volume forward. It kind of, I, again, you just want to isolate the problem. Just isolate the problem. And if it's not, if it's the pedals, that's one issue, then you will need noise gate or something like that. If it's not the pedals, uh, then again, check the reverb. And if it's not the reverb, uh, well, yeah, it's not supposed to do that. <laughs> so it could be something else. I doubt it's a speaker at that point. You'd have to look at other other issues it could be. Um, okay, hold on a second. 
Okay, Chris says, Chris just wants me to know he's watching while he's on vacation. Cheers. Cheers, my man. He's got a beer emoji, I think. I have a water emoji. Okay. Uh, Voodoo Fist. I love that name. Voodoo Fist says, saw your interview video with Mike Saldano. Uh, wound up purchasing a SLO 30. You bastard. Oh, you're lucky. Lucky. Lucky, lucky, lucky person. That was a great amp. I sat there and I plugged in that amp that day. And I, I remember loving the clean as much as the dirty. And just thinking that amp was just... That was the cat's pajamas. I don't have a saying, so I just said that. It was really good. So he bought that and a 212. Not bragging. Just kidding. <laughs> My favorite saying to the kids is, going to Target. Not bragging. I stole that from somewhere on the internet. I love it. Uh, kids don't. <laughs> says, uh, anyway, says, uh, I wound up purchasing an SLO 30 and a 212 cabinet after mind-blowing amp. Wow, the hype is real. Happy Labor Day weekend. Dude, uh, let me let me tell you. There are, there are a list of people... And it's a very short list in this industry who are good people. There's a very short list of people who are smart people. And there's a very short list of people who are very artistic. And then the list is even shorter when they're all three. And Mike Saldano is all three of those things. And, uh, and uh, that was a great day interview uh, because I had never met him before. He didn't know who I was. You know what I mean? He doesn't watch YouTube. You know, he's just sitting in a room because... He's got a new product to launch and they told him a bunch of YouTube guys were showing up and, and, you know, and he was, you know, he was happy as hell to sit there and talk to me about stuff. We just talked forever. It was crazy. Um, and, uh, but uh, like I said, uh, the amp was, was sick. It was, it was, it was everything I hoped it to be. Um, yes. So, you know, that's an amp. If I decide to get an amp like that, I, that's an amp. That's a, that's an amp that's on my, my list for sure. Oh. Such a good amp. Um, anyways, congratulations. Like I said, I know that's some big change, but man, that's a good amp. And like I said, everything about it's right. And I, I'm telling you, honest to God, I was so thorough with that day uh, about them. They honestly took the time to make that amp so much better. You know what I mean? Um, they did everything they could to make this new product line better. Um, no BS. Like there was no like, yeah, I mean, they're just changing things. No, everything was to improve that line. I think they're better than ever before. Now, quality wise. Now, again, sometimes the old stuff sounds good because it's got a thing going. But quality wise, I think it's the best Seldon ever made. And Seldon told me, honestly, that's what I said. He had the, that's why I was saying he's such a great character. He had no problem. If you watch the interview, and I don't know if it's in the interview or I cut it out. <laughs> I hope I didn't cut it out. Um, there's two interviews with him, by the way. You have to go on both channels. There's a longer one on the Know Your Gear channel. Um, that's the better one of the two. But, uh, you know, it's just how it works. That was the longer one I sent to the patrons and I gave the short one to the main channel. And then later I put the patron version on the smaller channel. But, um, he had told me um, an honest truth that I, I'd love to hear, which is he said, look, man, he's been running his business himself all these years. You know, he's got to put out fires every day. He's got to deal with customers. He's got to deal with stuff. And he just didn't have time to improve the amps. And so when he sold the company to, to Boutique, who owns it now, and now he can help design the amps and he can do the part that he's good at, which is designing amps. He doesn't have to like, hey, I have to sweep the bathroom next. You know what I mean? And I, my experience, a lot of times that sometimes that's a sign of failure, not a sign of failure, but the, the company goes to hell when everything, when the owner loses control like that. But in some cases, and I think this is the case, it's a big improvement because it takes the person who owns the company and it stops making them the person who's now the accountant, the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, like I said, the janitor, all those things and lets them focus on the thing that we really want them to focus, which is making really great amps. So, uh, I feel like I just kind of beat that subject to death. So let's go to the next one. All right. The convert says, I know I'm not doing these order, guys. Just bear with me. The convert says, hey, Phil, I noticed some great gear seems to never get talked about. Oh, okay. What is it? I have a PRS S2 Vela and an orange, orange, orange OR15, and I think they are both great. Why do you think they don't get attention? You're the best. Aha! I have given the S2 uh, Vela attention. I did a video uh, with it. I will put a link uh, in the description down below 
with Warren Hewitt, who is amazing. And that's one of my favorite videos I ever did. And uh, we did the Vela. In fact, he loved, I convinced him the Vela. I was like, you got to try the Vela. It's amazing. And then he loved that Vela so much. He has one now. Like I said, it's great. Um, and uh, so so we did that one. Oh, Orange is easy. Uh, Orange, re I think I've told the story. Orange reached out to me one time a couple years ago at Christmas and said, hey, would you be interested in trying out some product for videos? It was at Christmas time. It was really busy. I was dealing with some stuff. And uh, I was like, I can't do it right now. And then that ended that relationship. So in, in this business of YouTubing, uh, that sometimes that's the case. I didn't know that for many years. Okay. That's what makes this kind of a tough gig sometimes in when companies reach out, you don't realize like, apparently you can't say, why well, don't say you can't say no, but you can't say no. You know what I mean? You can't say like, I'll be like, Oh, cause I do it all the time. As you guys know, I'll be like, I can't do it right now. I can get to it later. That literally means like, we'll never talk again from, cause they'll never, you know, uh, so orange, that's what happened to orange. So, uh, I, I guess my opportunity was, you know, Hey, you want us to send you a product? And I was like, I'm, I'm kind of busy. I, I'd love to do it later at the end, you know, at the beginning of next year. And then I never heard back from him. And I think I messaged about once and never heard back. But like I said, their stuff's great. Like I told you guys, there's just nobody locally selling this stuff that I can get my hands on, you know what I mean, uh, in a way. And um, everything I've played, I liked. So, um, <laughs> James says, it's your fault. I hear that a lot. Sounds... <laughs> Since I bought the spark, it's awesome. So thank you. Have a beer. You're welcome, buddy. Uh, you know what? I, I've been, like I said, I've been kind of sitting on the back, on the sidelines on the spark. Every friend, I, I mean, not literally, but probably literally every friend I have bought a spark. Except for Ralph. I think he's the only one that didn't buy one. Uh, I mean, literally everyone I know bought a spark. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'll either get clobbered, but most everybody's saying the same thing. They love them. I'm telling you, I think, like I said, we all agree positive grid handled the whole thing wrong, but I'm telling you that amps a very impressive little practice amp. It's fun. Like I said, it's very good. Tony Goyburn. Hey, Tony, how's it going, buddy? He says, because I love what I learned from you over the last three years, I have taught, oh, you have, he means me. You have taught me to appreciate guitars in a whole new way and helped me to drive, uh, Oh, dive, not, not drive. Cause you don't want to drive into something. Uh, you want to dive into it. You know, he's uh, dives into, into making and modding guitars. Never done it without your encouragement, man. That's thank you so much. I don't know if I deserve that kind of accolade, but I, I, I take it and I say, thank you for it. Um, and, uh, and it's good. Like I said, uh, when I, I think, I think everybody who watches the live show knows the struggle. I can review something and I'll get a lot of views and it's pretty easy. And it's like, well, it's not easy, but you know what I mean? It's like, hey, it's an amp. <laughs> and then I do a video and like, this is how you fix this thing. And it gets way less views. But deep down, I always know because of these comments and these things you say that like, that's the right thing to keep making. I enjoy doing both. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes like, and I'm not going to lie, an unboxing video, you see me doing an unboxing video. I don't think I've ever done an unboxing video where I was like, man, oh, it was so much work. It's like unbox videos like, that was, that was fun. It's usually fun. The editing is usually some time, but not much. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, it gets, it gets hard to not lean into that. I think that's the one thing I, I remember as much as I make YouTube, I'm a fan of YouTube and I watch channels. And one of the things I watch on some of the channels that I like is not all of them, but a few of them started going down like, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, the, not, the wrong way, right? They're going down the wrong road. Like too many unboxing videos. All of a sudden it's like, everything's just an unboxing. Here's another unboxing. And this week I got this. And this week I got that. And this week I got this. And uh, yeah, those, those are fun. I like them. You like them. We all like them. But I go, yeah, don't, don't, don't turn into that. But the problem is, is it's so damn easy. It's like, you know, what did they send me? All right, let's open it up. <laughs> open it up in a box. <laughs> so, all right. Um, but okay, so back to Tony. That the thank you is for Tony. Thank you, Tony. Um, let's see. Hold on, I gotta get back to the other side. Uh, uh, somebody asked me what I mean by sides. I have two screens, right? So I hope that makes sense. I have two screens, and then uh, I keep super chats on one screen, and I keep uh, the regular uh, conversation, the flow of the conversation, on the other screen. So that's how I do that. So that way, I don't have to grab the super chats as they pop. It allows me to jump back into the conversation again. Okay, speaking of the conversation. Uh, 
Um, Daniel says, because there was so much negative feedback on positive grids, grids handling, I waited to order mine until a week away from something. I'm sorry, buddy. It just jumped on me because I didn't hold it, I guess, in place. Um, but he's basically saying he just got his, I think he said in 10 days. And, and I think I said this, please understand. Now, don't yell at me if the price goes up because I don't know if the price goes up. But like I said, anybody who's concerned about wanting to buy one of those amps but doesn't want to deal with any of this, like, will they ship it? Won't they ship it? Because everybody's been nervous, but everybody I've been talking to is like, yeah, I've been getting it pretty quickly. Uh, but, you know, it still makes me nervous. Um, I, I really, I think I understand the story, the rumor I heard is that Sweetwater is going to get them. I just don't know if the price goes up. But at least you won't have to deal with anything. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, so, so there you go. Um, and, and please don't, I don't want to overhype the amp. It's not the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's just a really good amp. You know what I mean? That's all just a really good practice amp. It's a practice amp. It's a little practice amp. I had somebody say like, I not, not cause of my suggestion, but somebody's like, you can't gig with this thing. I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> Ralph was playing it. <laughs> so, I tell you, so, so you guys know not to do this. Ralph was, it came over and he went into my office. I was doing something <laughs> and he plugged in the positive grid with, I have a six string bass and he's running the six string bass through it, the low B. And I, ca I came up stairs and he's like, man, it's kind of farting out. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think you're supposed to run like a six string, a low B string, like loud through it. Um, it was handling it, handling it, meaning it didn't blow, but yeah. So to, to answer anybody's questions, can you run a bass through it? I run a bass through it every day. I love it. Uh, especially for choir practice. Can you run a low B string through it on a bass? No, <laughs> unless you're really quiet it, It's the speakers were the weak spot in that, but I don't think that's, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> so. Caesar said, if all you did was unbox, I wouldn't mind it. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't mind it either. Like I said, it's it's it's, it's not easy because uh, I don't want to allude that anything's too easy. But it's as content goes, I don't think I do. I can't think of, I'm just, just, so you guys know, see, I'm pouring water. It's funny. So now I have these, this, I don't know what this is. Thermo Flask, sponsored by Thermo Flask. It's not, so you know. Um, it's a weird thing. Uh as you get older and the world changes on you and then you get weirded out by things. This thing is aluminum or aluminum and it has this little locking spout. My wife bought this for me. This is the thing that keeps your water cold. I swear to God, it's not a commercial. I'm not associated with these guys at all. I didn't even know what it was called until I just read it now because I'm going to sound like a commercial. But here's the thing. It keeps the water ice cold. It's kind of a weird, you know, as you guys all have these, these dual layer things that keep cool. But what weirds me out about this is it totally makes me laugh because in the army, I would never drink out of my canteen. <laughs> Just the idea of drinking out a metal container with that stupid, same thing, the turn thing and you flip it and you drink, right? Remember basic, anybody basic, drink water, drink water. And I went to basic in October, which is the worst. So they made, the whole time you're marching, you have to drink water. And then to make sure you drink the water, they made you o open up your canteen and hold it over your head. And then some of the privates, the water would just go over their head because they didn't drink all their water. Anyways, my point is, is I drink this now and that's all I have flashbacks to the army of how I didn't want to drink out of these things. And now my wife's paying 40 bucks or whatever the 20 bucks, whatever these things cost so I can drink water out of them. It's just funny. Right. Next thing I know, I'm going to eat bologna and cheese again. Green bologna and cheese. For those of you guys who remember green bologna and cheese. So, all right. Tony says, it's not gross. I, I, I don't know. It's just an idea. I don't know. The idea of drinking water out of metal was weird to me. It always was. Okay. So, uh, Ah, RNA is talking, but he R RNA music. He's saying uh, live streaming is easier. Maybe I actually think unboxing is easier than live streaming. Um, because uh, when I do live streaming, I think it's not. I mean, it's not the hardest thing ever. But sometimes uh, I'm reading all these questions and I'm trying to think and and uh, you know, it's actually I'll tell you. You know, it's hard about live streaming watching this thing after I just did it. Because after we end these things, I watch it and I timestamp it all. Watching me, it's like a, it's a Lewis, no, Lewis, uh, Lewis Black said, if you go to the gym and watch yourself work out, your brain can't handle the fact, like if you watch yourself do something you don't want to do, right? <laughs> something like that. Um, 
I feel like uh, same thing. <laughs> I'm like, I just I just did this, and now I'm watching me do it. It's the weirdest thing. Uh, okay. Um, Sean Brooks says, Phil, is it worth upgrading the Marshall Origin 20 to the Studio Vintage? Um, I don't know because I haven't compared the two. I just don't know the answer. Uh, I, I don't know. The sad thing is they're so far from each other in price point. I mean, you can get the Origins right now for a song, and even when they were uh, not cheap, they were inexpensive. I mean, it's double to get to the Studio 20. I just don't have a reference of those two. I don't know, but I wanted to at least comment on it. So, curious. All right. Uh, and then Jordan says, Ingle Rockmaster versus Marshall JCM 820 watt. He's like, which one? I don't know. You know, Ingle was going to send me the new... Um, Oh, what's wrong with me? Why can't I think? Fireball, 25. Uh, I, I But, you know, it's COVID, so I haven't sent it yet. But uh, that was as far back as, like, September of last year they were going to send it. Um, and then, you know, they ha it hadn't come out yet. I don't know if it even come out yet. Has it come out yet? It's kind of – I've seen a little bit, but not some places. But they were supposed to send one so we could check it out on the channel. Um, but – I haven't seen it. So no, f not familiar with it. Um, and, and here's why. This is why I'm telling you that story. I was going to buy an Ingle Rockmaster. <laughs> I've had this problem now a couple times with companies, guys. I, I want you to understand some of this stuff. I always tell you guys this stuff because I, I just want you to know, you know what I mean? Try to be upfront about stuff. Sometimes I just decide I'm going to buy something like a Rockmaster amp. I decided that, uh, you know, sometimes I'll have to go, oh, maybe I'm going to get, I don't know, the new blah, blah, blah pedal. And I decide I'm going to do that. And then a company reaches out to me and goes, "Hey, we want to send you this." So, so like, I give me, a, I'll give you a, an analogy, a story, so it's not specific to a company. It'd be like if I decided I'm going to buy the new, uh, the new Fender Tone Master amp, and I go, "Yeah, I'm going to buy that." And then Fender calls me up and goes, "Hey, we're going to send you this amp. It's different, but you're like, oh, okay. Well, then I'll wait. I'm not going to buy a Tone Master amp until they send this amp. What happens if I like that amp? Maybe more, right? So like the Rockmaster, I've been wanting a Rockmaster. And when they were like, oh, we'll send you the Fireball 25. I'm like, oh, well, crap. They're going to send me the Fireball 25. What happens if I like it more? And I'll, I've already bought the Rockmaster. I'll have to sell the Rockmaster, deal with all that. So this happens sometimes on the channel where a company, you know, so I'm just waiting. So once they, so here's the, what I'm saying. If I get the, if I get the fireball 25, let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to love it and keep it. Or I'm not going to love it. And I'm buying the rock master. <laughs> there you go. So that's the answer. So to answer your question, rock master versus the JCM 800, I'm not saying they're so different. I can't say <laughs> they're so different. <laughs> uh, they're so different, but me, I would pick the Ingle over the JCM 800 because I had that tw the 20 watt JCM 800 and it was nice. I liked it. I ended up not loving it. Um, all right, let's hop over. Let's get some of those super chats because we're gonna have to button this episode up pretty soon. And while I'm reading, I will drink. All right, we have looking for something cool. What do we have that's cool? Okay, Tony's got a question. Let's see what Tony's question is. Tony's question says, hey, Phil, how much, by the way, you guys, some of you guys are Tony, uh, Tony, both Tonys, Tony, uh, Tony Franconi and Tony Goyburn, both you guys crazy, $25 each. That's nuts. Thanks for the super chat. It's very, very gracious of you. Um, says, hey, Phil, how much of a different, have a difference would one feel between a nine and a half versus a 12 inch radius on a strat neck? Also, what would be the optimal fret size? Okay, you'll notice it. It's not a subtle. It's uh, it's not subtle. It's obvious. I have a twelve. I have both nine and a half inch and twelve inch radius fretboards on my Strats. And what I will tell you is, I can tell immediately touching them. You know, I mean, if you hand me each one of the guitars, I know immediately when I'm playing them, they're different. Um, believe it or not, I have my like I said, my Fender Custom Shop is a twelve inch radius. I really like it, but I but but. Owning a 12-inch radius fretboard Strat for all of these years, what I've really learned about myself is 9.5 is where I like it. <laughs> Which is funny. I got the 12.5 made because I was like, I don't like 9.5. I like 12. You know, Fender got it right. 9.5. So, 
I like the nine and a half over 12. You will notice it vice versa. It's for sure. What, uh, would be the optimal fret, fret size for me my favorite thing that fender's done and that's probably why another reason why i like the nine and a half right now to me the american professional strat with the vintage tall fret wire it's 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 the thing for me it's the, it's my favorite guitar by far it's it, it's sometimes you're lucky uh when i mean lucky is you don't fall in love with the most expensive damn guitar on the market <laughs> right uh the american professional strat is expensive but it's something that can be picked up, you know, for about a thousand to twelve hundred dollars, which is a lot of money. But it ain't no crazy PRS Gibson money at that point, um, you know. So I mean, it's still somewhat of a realistic price range for a guitar in the used market. Uh, I love it. Vintage tall fret wire on the nine and a half inch on the American Professional. I absolutely love it. I have two American Professional Strats, and I love them both. Absolutely. Um, in fact, I think I've said this. I like my green. If you've seen my green American Professional Strat, I like that guitar more than my Copper Strat. I just like the Copper Strat in the idea that it's special. So, I mean, they're both great. So I can't really say like, oh, you know, way better. But I like the green one better. I like the way it sounds a little better. I like the way it plays a little better. Feels better. But the Copper Strat is just cool because no one has one. <laughs> well, not, not like that. You know what I mean? So it gives you like a kind of cool fe feeling. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I have something unique. Unique's always fun. Okay. Uh, let's see. Nicholas says, currently have a Fender Ultra Strat. Fender Pro. Oh, yeah. You know what? Hold on. Dude, I don't know why. I'm sorry, buddy. But that just ju jumped. It's the worst when I have something and then it brings it, it, like the computer updates and brings in all the new ones. So hold on, Nicholas. Give me a second to get back to you. Oh, you know what? It might have shown me an old one. Because now I don't see it. Okay. Well, then we'll go from the top. We'll go from Dark Shadow. Dark Shadow. Oh, Shadow Wito. Shadow Wito. I'm never going to say it right. Or I'm saying it exactly right. I don't know which one. You guys figured it out. It says, hey, Phil. I've been playing for 14 months. I've accumulated nine guitars. That's almost one a month. That might be the might be a problem. But we'll go on. Well, let's, let's hear this out before we judge him. Tenth on the way. It's not looking good so far, buddy. <laughs> Four amps. I have a problem. Okay. We're here to help. We're here to help. Now, is that normal? Yeah. It's it's normal if you have money. <laughs> yes. No. If you are new, if you buy a guitar, let's be very clear. If you buy a guitar and you don't have expend, uh, disposable income like crazy. You buy a guitar and then sometimes a year later you buy the next guitar, sometimes. If you buy a guitar and you have disposable income, yes. Have I seen uh, uh, people buy 10 guitars in the first year of playing guitar? Yeah, of course, I've seen it. Just, if they have the money, you can do it. It's your money. If it makes you happy, do what the hell you want with it. No one should be able to tell you what to do with your money as long as, like I said, as long as you're not doing anything legal or hurting anyone, it's your money. Trust me, there's worse things to do with your money than buy a guitar. Some of us know exactly what those things are because we've done them, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Dumb things. We do dumb things with our money. So, all right. So what, what am I trying to say? Uh, I'm trying to say, uh, do you have a problem? Yes, you have a problem. It's not a bad problem, but it is a problem. Um, as long as you're practicing, that's my only advice, man. Just don't. This is the reason why I say that. It's not because when like some comments are always like, well, you want to play guitar more and stop buying less. Yeah, the, the, no one should have a say what you're doing. But what I will tell you is if you don't practice, you won't, you won't, you'll just have a bunch, in a couple years, you'll have a bunch of guitars and that's it. So just make sure, you know what I mean? And if you're going to, if you have the means to keep buying guitars, try to put some goals assessed, uh, attached to that, Okay. You know what I mean? A fun thing to do with a new guitar is say, if I buy this guitar, I promise myself to learn this. I do that all the time. It works for me all the time. It's it's still BS, man. I told myself, I said I wasn't going to say BS. I feel like I said, so cheesy. Um, but like, you know, hey, I'll get a jazz guitar, but I got to learn one jazz tune. You know what I mean? Um, and that's why when I have all these guitars, sometimes that's what I've done. I'm like, okay, I'll get an SG, but I got to learn at least two ACDC songs. You know what I mean? Um, it's it's not that important, but to me it's important because it's again I don't I don't want to just buy stuff. But yeah, even though there's nothing wrong with just buying stuff, you can just you know sometimes some people collect bobblehead things and stuff, Beanie Babies. I don't know. Some people collect crap. 
So you're allowed to collect whatever you want, but practice because I'm just giving you good advice. If you don't practice and play, this uh, will be a short-lived hobby for you. Um, and then uh, Enrico says, C19, COVID-19, uh, ruin the used market. Price tags uh, are obnoxious. Absolutely. Uh, everyone I know who's selling on Reverb right now is selling in record speeds of, of used gear. Um, and, and yes, and any, all of us know looking late at night, looking for that, Hey, what new thing could we be looking at? There's not a lot of new cool things to be looking at when it comes to used market. Yes. What we'll talk about on the show in the future, if you guys want to talk about it, uh, you know, where, when does this change? Cause it will change, right? We can't be in a hyper market. We're in a hype, oh, I don't know, hy in a hyper market, but everybody's selling a crap ton of guitars and there's all kinds of reasons for that. And everybody's right. I've heard every reason like, well, it's cause people are trapped at home. Yes. It's cause people are getting those stimulus checks. Yes. It's cause, <laughs> it's cause people are bored and they need something to do. Yes. It's because, right. I mean, there's all these reasons and it's collectively all those reasons, right? That's how the world works. It's just a lot of little things happening and creating a big thing. So there's all this thing. The question is, when does it change? Um, and why, and, um, and believe it or not, there's more than just like the political side of it. Like, oh, the, when, you know, when the, 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 uh, voting happens, it'll change. Or when this happens, it'll change. Uh, there's all kinds of things we don't know. It's, it's all speculation, but, it, but as we go, it's something we'll talk about on the channel because it's interesting. Um, but yeah, it definitely has changed the used market for sure. Uh, okay. This comes from Nick. Nick says, Hey man, I love the channel. Uh, I've been watching for some time and I love the vids. What's your opinion on Schecter guitars? Man, I love Schecter guitars. I just did the C1. By the way, just to show you what fun it is to be a YouTuber, I was hanging out with my patrons last week. I think it was last week. It might've been a little longer than that, like a week and a half. But I was hanging out with the patrons and we were talking about the channel and I was showing them how I made $17 on the video I did of the Schecter for 31,000. Now I wasn't whining and complaining. <laughs> <laughs> I was showing them for informational purposes, right? So I just want you to have context of it. I found out since the reason why it's so low is because it had the word exotic in it and somehow that f flagged or changed the advertiser. So if you look at that video now, it doesn't say C1 exotic anymore. Yes, you have to watch what you're doing on YouTube. It's a different world. <laughs> so uh, not that I was uh, going to make 31,000 is big money, but you know, 17 bucks for six hours worth of editing and filming. It didn't feel too awesome. But uh, to answer your question, love them. I have another Schecter uh, video coming uh, very soon. Uh, and when I say very soon, I, I don't know when it's going to come out. You know what I mean? I don't know when I'm going to have it placed out. But, I mean, it's it's done. It's a finished product at this point. Um, but love them. Highly love them. Uh, I'm a big proponent for Schecter guitars. Very good. Guitars for the money. You Schecter guitars are better than new guitars because, like I said, they... Uh, I just literally, I think I was telling my buddy Tim this yesterday. Was that yesterday? Maybe the day before, probably day before Wednesday, uh, that I saw a Schecter guitar at Zim's guitars and it was a, uh, set neck C1 with, I think it had Duncan designs. I can't remember, but it had, you know, Grover tuning keys and it was 250 bucks in his main Korea. And I said, dude, that guitar new is like 1500 bucks. Now, if you run those specs, right. Set neck main Korea, they're a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars for now, if new for guitars like that. So it's just funny, like that just tells you you can't buy a better guitar for two hundred fifty bucks, in my opinion. So uh, look at if you like Schecter's, like I do, don't forget to check out those used ones as well. Uh, I like the new ones, but used ones definitely check those as well. Um, Grumpy Mike Guitar said, "And why not? Love the podcast. Thank you, Grumpy Mike. I enjoyed the video yesterday. You did the. He's doing a Thursday." What is it? It's like cheap pedals, but you had a cool saying. <laughs> uh, thrifty Thursday pedals. I'm pretty sure I'm close to right with that. So um, so that was cool. Like I said, I, I got to listen to it. I, I listen to stuff like that. Um, anyone who uh, you know, supports or sub subscribes to my channel, if I, I see your channel, I, I try to support it by listening to it, let it play. I let it play on a loop. I'll put all you guys in a playlist and I literally just let it play. I, I work a lot where I'm just looking down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes you're just looking down. You know what I mean? I look it down, working on something and I just have that playing. So sometimes I'll look over like what you're talking about, what you're saying. And so I get to enjoy it that way. So, um, uh, but yeah, that was a good video. Um, okay. And then Andy says, Look at the clock. It says, Andy says, Phil, oh, Andy 
jumped. See, I, I know what it is. It keeps jumping from, and, okay, Andy says, Phil, any opinion on the Gibson LP tribute? The ones that are satin finish and have you ever played a Gris 5 amp? They look sweet. Never tried one, but G-R-I-E-S five. I've learned this little trick when I index now. I got to just spell it out because <laughs> otherwise I'm just telling you what I'm doing because I'm going to start spelling out stuff like that now because when I'm listening and I'm typing the index later, I'll just type the spelling. And Otherwise, I always have to go back to your super chat and see how you spelt it. Um, I haven't tried the amp out, but I'll put a little link to the uh, to their website so we can so I can take a, a gander at them. Uh, Gibson, I, I think all the Les Paul tributes, I think all the Gibson tribute stuff, here's what it is. They're hit and miss. Like I said, they're cool guitars. Good investments if you buy them for the right price. They always go up in value. Some of them are the worst Gibsons ever played in fit and finish stuff, but that a lot of that can be corrected with some by taking it to a tech or doing it yourself. So that's the thing. So for the money, good stuff, but I feel like uh, a little remiss if I didn't say some of the worst Gibsons I've ever seen have been some of the tribute stuff, because again, sometimes it's like, man, some of the tooling marks and stuff, I mean, are really bad on those, but good stuff. And I did find Nicholas's super chat finally. It says, currently have an Ultra Strat. He's got the Fender Ultrastrat. Fender Pro Tele, Gibson Les Paul Standard, PRS Core, McCarty 594, mind you, he has that. It says, and I need to add a shred guitar. Okay, thoughts on either Ibanez RG550 or a Schecter Apocalypse with Sustainiac. Um, I'm a big fan of both. If you said, I want the 80s, thin 80s sound, I don't want to say thin like it's a bad thing, but that thinner kind of, you know, 80s sound. <laughs> RG550 all the way, uh, but I think the Schecter Apocalypse Swiss Sustaining is a better quality guitar. It's a cool guitar. I know I have a viewer here that loves this 550, so I don't want to, you know, he's good. He's right now, you know, he's like, what? I mean, I love my RG550, but I think the she uh, Schecter Ap Apocalypse with Sustainiac is a sweet guitar. Plus, the Sustainiac is a new thing, man. It's different. Um, what I will caution you about, because I have an RG550, and here's what I will tell you. It's fun to pull that thing out. I literally say, as a joke, the neck feels like a row of saltine crackers. It's so thin. It's so thin, it's kind of fun, but it also is so weird. You play it, it's, you know what I mean? It's kind of its own thing. Um, and I, I have to tell you, when I play an RG550, when I play an Ibanez like that, for me, it's... About, I had one when I was like, you know, 17. So when I play it, it's like, oh yeah, remember being 17? <laughs> so that's, a, that's all it is for me. It's not like, wow, this thing's great. It's great. It's just, it's a memory. It's a memory of time. So, so that's, so be, to take that for what it's worth. Um, okay. Ben says, after 15 years of playing Epiphone, I got a Gibson 17 Les Paul uh, tribute gold top satin and a spark Oh, I thought we did this one already. And he said, oh, no, we didn't. And he says in Gibson, the, oh, he got a spark and it came today, 12 days from the order, which is good. Guess what he's doing this weekend? I'm going to say you're going to play your Gibson into that spark. Now, do I get some? Oh, I got $5 Super Chat for getting that right. That was pretty good. I did good. <laughs> uh, it's a, I should have read that like an old Johnny Carson bit. What is going to be playing it this weekend <laughs> anyways uh all right <laughs> and maybe it wasn't even that funny i don't know why i'm laughing so hard okay uh J jim says from from a marketing perspective which products are the most overhyped okay here's the question guitars amps pedals cables etc or is it still all of them I, I think it's i think it's hard i think it's changed so much in the last few years that it's hard uh, it's not fair to say this but over the time period cables have been the most s silly marketed thing you know what i mean was it was it vox <laughs> so many companies ended up doing it i can't i feel horrible saying vox did it because vox did do it but there's probably others vox remember when vox came out with cables like one was for bass guitar one was for electric guitar. I know some of you really techie nerds are going to be like, man, but let me tell you the differences. Their low frequencies travel through the copper at a different speed. And I, I, but I mean, it was just, I remember thinking like, what, what, what is that? What happens that you're at a show and you're like, Hey, got a cable. Yeah, but it's for bass. Ah, oh, crap. I have guitar. And then they had an acoustic one. They had an acoustic guitar one. They had an electric guitar one. They had a bass one. Here's what I remember. This is true. I remember we were dealer. That's how I know this. We carried all three. This is what happened. We sold all the electric guitar ones and then we blew out the bass and acoustic ones to dudes who are like hey man i only got six bucks for a cable and we're like well here's a 60 dollars cable you can have six bucks it says for bass but you can plug your guitar into it 
<laughs> so yeah, cables got a little out of control to the point where we know even, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Monster cables got sued. Now I think that was for HDMI and nothing really to do with our side, but for claiming stuff that wasn't true. So cables have always been a little bit on the silly stuff. The thing about cables that always made me laugh back in the day was cable companies, guitar, guitar cable companies, companies that sold cables were the only companies I knew that could walk in a shop and literally throw hundred dollar samples at you. Like they were like, they were Twizzlers, like candy. Like I remember one guy came in with Ziola thousand. It was a, that was a thousand dollars. It was a thousand dollars. It was silver cable. It was like a hundred and fifty or two hundred fifty dollar cable, two hundred fifty bucks for like ten feet cable, and he gave it to me. And he's like, "Here you go. Try this out. And soon, I I know you'll be calling me to order these for your store." And we're like, "What the hell?" <laughs> so yeah, we would get all these cables uh, all the time. In fact, it it was for years. It sucked. Well, it was great, but sucked because I had like fifty. And my, per, I, my personal cables were like 50 mismatched branded cables of all these free cables I got all the years. So I just used those. And over time, why I said it sucked was you start realizing like, I couldn't start telling the difference after time. Like, is this my $100 cable or is this my $20 cable? Like, I can't tell. It's just the same thing. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, all of it's hyped, but the cables were always always what stuck out. I think the cable thing's toned down though. I think everybody's gotten more practical and realistic about the cables. I don't think there's as many ridiculous claims about cables. Cables are important. Don't get me wrong. Okay. They are important, but some of the claims got a little silly. Uh, and then if I was going to say, just, you know, for fun, let's say, uh, you said, you said guitars, amps, pedals, cables. I'm going to say cables, the most, uh, uh, ridiculous, then pedals, then guitars and amps, probably amps are probably the least. You know what I mean? Because it's hard to hype the amps. You know what I mean? I think in hype thing, the only thing that's hyped on amps is maybe hand wired for the most part. And here's the problem with that. Whether it sounds better or not, it's expensive to make because it takes more time to make it. So it's one of those things like it's more expensive, but it is, it does take more time to make. So it does have, it's not like it's totally, you know, BS. And I'm still going to keep using that word apparently or the term. term. All right. I think, I think I'm going to call it. I'm going to try to hit one more, two more, and then we'll keep the rest for later. We'll do Carl. Carl. Carl says, uh, Hey Phil, fellow Arizona person here. Cool. He said AZ person. I'm just assuming it's Arizona. He could be like A to Z. Like he's like, I like the whole alphabet, just like you. Uh, it says after watching your videos, I drove into, uh, Oh, I dove into modding. Also did a Kramer Beretta special. Uh, he goes, lastly, as he's saying, Lassie, Lassie, special Lassie. I think I just want to stick with what I understand. He did a Kramer Beretta special. He said, losing my fingers, uh, feeling f from MD, M, M and D. I got to read this first so I can process it. Hold on guys. So it's getting harder to play. Okay. So he's losing. I understand he's losing the feeling in his fingers. I know what you mean, buddy. He's basically saying he's losing the feeling in his fingers from M and D. Um, and so it's getting harder to play. I, I understand. And that's, and so you understand it's Carl. Here's a thought. And this is what's really cool. I think about this. Uh, I think what, what, when I, when I hear somebody going through issues were exactly like that, they're losing their, their feeling in their hands or they're having arthritis or their stuff se seizing up. And there's all these problems that's preventing them from playing guitar. I, I think about like most people probably think about like, what would I do if this happens to me? It's a, it's a thought that I think about all the time. And to be honest with you, I, 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 I think at first I'm like, well, I'd find an invention, which we talk about all the time, things that would help me play guitar. That's for sure. But I think, uh, for me, I find joy in so many aspects of the guitar stuff. So it's not only just playing the guitar, but I find joy in repairing it or working on it or modding it and, um, or, or all kinds of things, you know, right. Doing all kinds of stuff. So I think, um, if that's what's happening to you, you're losing the feeling in your fingers and it's getting harder to play guitar. Um, obviously try to find anything that's going to help you. I've, I've done some videos that I'm not saying they're going to help you, but just be keep in mind, I have video search for them where we've talked about all kinds of products that are designed to help people kind of, uh, you know, lengthen the amount of time they can play guitar as long as they can. But like I said, I'm glad you got into mods and stuff because that's one thing that I think even when you lose a little feeling in your fingers and stuff, I think you can still do some of the mods and do stuff like that. So find, find the joys in all this aspects of this is uh, how it works. And the reason I say that is because a lot of the joys I have is a lot of us are, 
were in love with guitar as a secondary thing. In other words, we wanted to play on a stage. A lot of us like, hey, I want to be a rock star, right? Or a blues star, whatever. And I want to be a rock star. And then that didn't work out. So now this is my, this is what I'm doing now. And it's making me happy. So don't be afraid to remember that there's other things besides just playing the guitar that can make you happy around the guitar itself. So there you go. You can become a blogger about guitars. Find joy in that. So I just tell you, I just say that because that's what I think about. I think about if that stuff happens to me, that's the thoughts I have. I, what, not so much, what am I going to do? I can't play guitar. It's okay. This is what I'll probably lean into. I'll probably do more, you know, blogging. I'll do more repair. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. Okay. Now I know I might've missed a, su a couple super chats here and there. And and I'm going to try to hit a couple real quick ones right now. Andrew said, uh, Phil, your favorite non-traditional shaped guitar. Uh, you know, I, I think right now it's the V guitar. I don't know why I have it in my head that I want a V guitar, uh, a flying V, a Gibson flying V, or an, actually I want an Epiphone. I want, here's what I want. I want a white Karina Epiphone flying V. There you go. <laughs> so that's the my favorite non-traditional guitar. For me, that's non-traditional. Some of you guys are like a V's normal, but I want a white Karina uh, Epiphone V. I don't know why. So, so, so. okay. Um, and then um, and then I think I got most of the others. Let me let me check real quick. Like I said. And then Sean, who's spelled C-H-A-U-N, wants me to know phonetically it's spelled, pronounced Sean. That's my son's name, S-E-A-N, Sean. Says, hi, Phil. Or, hey, Phil. He says, hey, Phil. I got a 2020 Epiphone Explorer this weekend, and I'm loving it. Have a beer on me. That's a really cool super chat. <laughs> it's, I bought myself a guitar. Here's some money. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I will get, I will, I won't get drunk. I will drink a beer. I promise you, Sean. Tonight, yep, I'm thinking about tonight. Because uh, tonight, I'm going to watch the new Bill and Ted movie. I got my kids to watch the first one on uh, Wednesday, the second one yesterday, and the third one today. I don't know if that's abuse <laughs> or what, but tonight, I will have a drink. I will have a beer. I will have a beer. And I'll have a beer in honor of your Epiphone Explorer. I will actually, and my kids will think I'm crazy because I'll be like, in honor of the Epiphone Explorer. And then I'll take a drink. And then they'll look at me like that's my father and then they'll sigh in sadness and then we'll watch the movie okay so uh, <laughs> so, uh michael did a super chat for no reason just to do the chip jar man i appreciate that so much um and then <laughs> we'll do the last refresh and then we're gonna we're gonna call it uh uh at least at least i'm laughing if i hope that helps you guys sometimes uh, please give me a second to scan. Uh, I think I got them. I think I, I think I did it. I try. I, I know sometimes I miss some and I'm going to do a thing where I'm going to go through these and try to find all the ones and maybe hit them on a video where, you know, all the ones will slip through the cracks. Andrew just super chat for no reason. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate that. And then uh, Snick Juice, which I love saying his name, Snick Juice said, a lace sensor, Illumitones especially, question mark. But I don't know what the question was. Um, I can tell you this. I, I like uh, lace sensors. I am not a huge fan of Illumitones. It's not because I, I don't like them. I'm just, again, uh, nothing has compelled me to want to put them in a guitar. Every time I play a guitar with them in there, they're fine. But nothing's ever made me go, ah, I got to get these and put them in a guitar. So they're one of the few pickups I don't have in a guitar. Those are a pickup that I think all kinds of things about them. But I, I would love, that's probably a pickup that would probably do well in a Somnium guitar where I can compare them to another pickup and then actually f figure out what it is I'm hearing or not hearing in those pickups. Uh, that would be great. Guitar accent, that's child abuse, Phil. Yeah, you know. <laughs> they actually enjoyed the Bill and Ted movies. They're holding up, they said. So that's good. Uh, and then, uh, I want to say Guillermo? Guillermo. Um, Guillermo uh, Mendoza says, Hey, Phil, just purchased a coffee mug and a t-shirt from Know Your Gear. Can't wait for it to arrive. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Those things fund the channel for sure. Uh, 
And then uh, Eddie says, how much is a signed shirt? I don't know why you would want me to sign a shirt, but I wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, if you, uh, you'd have to, Eddie, I don't know why you would want this again, but, you know, God bless you for the kindness <laughs> of even asking. Uh, to get a, a shirt signed, what you would have to do is email at askknowyourgear at gmail.com. I would forward the email to my wife. She would, we have the entire, I know you buy the shirts the same way I do on Teespring and stuff. But so, you know, my wife is, uh, uh, has like the entire ability to print, a, make a shirt here. Like she physically can make shirts. And a lot of the shirts I wear, she's just making them for me. She has the presses and all this stuff and the, the printing systems and stuff. So she would print you a special shirt and then have me sign it. I, 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 uh, I've signed like three things in my entire life <laughs> and that's how I do it. She does it and then I, I sign it and then, uh, you know, and then she'll, you know, so that's how you would do it. Ah, Christopher says it's pronounced gizmo. Okay. I hope that's, um, Jimmy says, we're going to end on this note with Jimmy. Jimmy McKee says, would you sell KYG pickups even as a small batch or two? Look, I, I, I got, you know, you guys know I make pickups. I, I'm going to just tell you right now, the guitar, obviously for the great guitar build off hat, I wound a set of humbuckers for that guitar. Um, I, I don't, uh, I, yes. So I'll just tell you now, and then we'll end on this note because most people have dipped out by now. So if you're watching me an hour and 40 minutes into this thing, you're probably a good viewer. Uh, and, and, and I appreciate you. Um, right now downstairs, I am, I am currently winding, uh, pickups. Uh, and what I mean by that is for the 300 now, this isn't the unofficial tease of this. So you guys know the channel is at 275,000 subscribers. It hit 275,000. I think yesterday, 275,000 it, when it hits 30, 30 when it has 300,000 subscribers we got hosed uh so you know as a channel uh at 250,000 quarter million subscribers we we're going to do the, the a cool giveaway with two uh guitars from warmoth we we're going to build remember i was going to build two identical guitars and one for you and one for me and it was a big deal well covid happened and i couldn't go to warmoth and then all all that fell through and it's uh and like even uh, aaron at warmoth had said on his channel we're doing something with Phil and it's still going to happen. Yeah, it's still going to happen. But remember, we got to wait till all this to go. So I was at 300,000 subscribers. I said, look, I don't want to make a plan that follows through. So um, 300,000 subscribers is going to be, my guess is somewhere February or March of next year is where I'll probably hit 300,000. It might be a little longer than that, you know, but but I I think on the best I can do or trend as 300, as in February next year or March. What I'm doing now and what I have been doing uh, is I'm winding a special set of pickups. These are sets of single coil pickups, three sets for strats. These are special. I will talk about them. They are, when I say special, no magic wire. In fact, I'll tell you what they're called. They're called CB, um, <laughs> CB 4205s. 42 for the gauge. It's 42 gauge wire and it's an Alnico 5 magnet. <laughs> what a name. CB stands for... Uh, oh, CP. Sorry, CP stands for copper plated. That will make sense when you see them. Um, they are no magic, no special. I'm just winding these pickups. I'm winding a bunch of sets. I'm doing it now, so I have them then. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to make them all, make a video about them, make a video about how I made them, why I made them, how many sets there are, and then... Uh, and then I'll have so many sets available just for patrons so patrons can get them if they want them. And then I'll have so many sets for the, the main channel here. And then we'll sell them as a limited run and they're gonna come with some special graphics and stuff, just stuff to so celebrate the channel. So it's weird because I'm not doing a giveaway for 300,000. These will be for sale, but it'll be something I, I promise will be interesting and cool. What I will tell you what I'm giving away is it's gonna be an insane amount of time is how many I've, I've been winding pickups like insanely. Uh, and I think my wife is sick, all these pickups, uh, what she's seen me do. So that's what I'm doing. So, uh, cell block four. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that, like I said, I thought it was funny to name them exactly what they are. They are copper plated on the bottom and, uh, they are 42 gauge wire with Alnico fives. So that's the teaser on those. So yes, will I do pickups? Yes. I'm, I'm doing them right now. These are a special packaging, everything special about them. Like I said, no, no, uh, 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 Dave says copper plated. Here's, here's the thought. I, 
I've showed them to all my friends. I don't have one to show you. I'll, I'll show you the prototype right now. I promise if I had one relatively close. Um, the uh, um, uh, Think of a Telecaster pickup. They're like strap pickups, but like a Telecaster. Okay. Uh, and then somebody said, uh, Jesse says, how much? I don't know how much. We'll figure all that later. Obviously, uh, you know, they'll be reasonable because I'm going to, you know, make them reasonable. So it'll be fun. And then we'll probably give away some, you know what I mean? Uh, in fact, uh, I, I, you know, that is for sure too. So there'll be some giveaways some stuff like that. So everybody will have a chance. It'll be like, that's what I'm trying to do. It'll be like we always do on this channel, something fun right? It'll be something that everybody gets to enjoy a video. Some people will enjoy winning it. Some people will enjoy buying it. You know what I mean? You know, we'll do some fun stuff. Um, uh, Kranir, Kranir, Siku, I don't know how to say it, man. I'm a, I'm a name butcherer on this channel. It says, Phil McKnight, what are, uh, what, it, what are we as a small YouTuber expected to do in order to get a channel shout out from you? Cheers. Uh, you just got one. Although I don't know what the channel is, so I'll put a link in the index it's at the end. That's, I don't know. That's, you know, you can send me an email sometimes. I mean, I try to do shout outs when I can, as much as I can. Um, but sometimes I like to make sure I check out your channel first. So at least I know what I'm shouting out. So if you send me a link to your channel, guys, if you send me links to your channels, the odds of me responding is like almost zero. The odds of me actually clicking it and watching it on my phone somewhere when I'm waiting to get like my oil change or something. It's very good. So at least I'll see it. And if I see it, then there's an opportunity for me to maybe promote it one day. Again, I can't promise the world, man. I just can't. But I try, you know what I mean? I try to try to build this out so that we're all, you know, it's, it's a bigger show than just me, I hope. On that note, I'm going to let you guys go. I want to hope you guys have a great weekend. I will let you know next Friday what I think of the new Bill and Ted movie and what my kids thought of it. So far, they liked the first two. They said the first one's better than the second one. Although my son said the second one made him laugh more. There's my official review on that. I'll tell you guys what I think. Uh, and then on that note, I will let you guys go. And until next week, I guess I'll say thank you for your time and know your gear. <laughs>